And therefore, Paul then continues in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. And yet, no pause. And I no longer live. Of course, meaning my old life, my self-willed life, my self-reliance, me who can decide on its own. No, I no longer live, but Christ lives in me, and the life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I have been crucified with Christ means, according to Oswald Chambers, going through the crisis of death, a white funeral, the burial of old life. It's, in effect, the breaking of my independence with my own hand and surrender to the kingdom rule of God. It's relinquishing the right to myself. That's the reason Paul is speaking and can speak very clearly in Romans three times about obedience, a word that is not being used very often nowadays, but obedience that comes from faith. Faith as identification with Christ, participation in his death, and having a new life in God. And so the passion of Christianity is, according to Oswald Chambers, that I deliberately sign away my own rights and become a bond servant, a bond slave, and a yoke fellow of Jesus Christ, out of love for Jesus. Francis Stanford, one of our WEC leaders in the 1950s, he wrote in Operation Ivory Coast. In 1950, a touch of revival came upon the Suenula Church. And those from Ivory Coast know that Suenula Church. Through reading the little book the Calvary wrote, there came to the missionaries a fresh revelation of the holiness of God, the wrath of God, his hatred of sin, but his reckless love to fill us with new life, leading to a deep humbling, breaking, and melting. And Roy Hessen explains that revival is the life of Jesus in us. But, he says, that life can only hold, uh, take hold in us and develop in us if and when our own will is broken. Our own will. That's basically the death principle. Our own will is broken. And we are fully surrendered to God. Brokenness and surrender are the beginning of revival. It's no longer I and me. And you know that's very much uh, our present situation in, in the Western world. I and me. But it's Christ. And uh, Roy Hessian says, the brought stubborn, self-righteous, selfish, and self-reliant ego needs to surrender and be broken. I need to agree to my own death, death to sin, death to self-life, and self-will and self-reliance. Hudson Taylor describes his spiritual secret differently. He focuses on Jesus, and he wrote once, uh, to his sister, uh, if you can get it, get that book by his uh, son about the secret of Hudson Taylor. You're aware that C.T. Studd worked 10 years in China with Hudson Taylor. Quote, all the time I felt assured there was, that there was in Christ all I needed. But the question was, how to get it? Notice the question. As gradually light dawned, I saw that faith was the only requisite. I strove for faith, but it wouldn't come. I tried to exercise it, but in vain. 
How to get faith strengthened? And he says, not by striving after faith, but by resting on the faithful one. The Spirit of God revealed to me, said Taylor, the truth of our oneness and intimate union with Christ, as I had never known it before. But Jesus said, don't rejoice because your work is making progress. Rejoice because your names are written in the Lamb Book of Life. The greatest reason for joy is not that we are successful missionaries, but that we are adopted sons of Jesus. That's the basis for joy. Even if I don't win one soul all my mission life, I will yet rejoice in the Lord. Hallelujah. How many of you know that rest is a command? It's the second amendment. If you read, American know what second amendment is. <laughs> if you read Exodus 20, of the ten commandments, the number one command is worship. The number two command is rest. Thou shalt observe the Sabbath day, keep it holy. On that day, do no work. All the other commands are PowerPoint. Thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery. Worship and rest are big. So I hope you confess your sin of restlessness. Because I didn't want to keep perpetuating it. That's why you didn't see me yesterday. I just rested. <laughs> Hallelujah. Because the first thing Jesus promised to give you was not work. Come unto me, O ye that labor and a heavy laden, I will give you work. What will I give you? It's only as you rest that you can carry a yoke. May the Lord help us to rest. I have given Jericho into your hand. Keep your eyes on Jericho. Don't look at the closed door. Has God led you into a field, into a nation? Did he give you a promise? A missionary never steps out without a promise. Living by faith is not a question of I don't have money. Living by faith is depending on what God told you when you were going out. And never you step out without a word from God. And when things are not working, get back to what he said. God will never give you beyond your vision. God will never give you beyond what you are seeing. He told Abraham in Genesis 13, after Lot has separated, Lift up your eyes to the north, to the south, to the east, to the west. All the land you see, I will give you. So what are you seeing? Are you seeing the closed doors or you are seeing the promised people? The disciples. In Matthew 9, Jesus was ministering. He saw the multitude. He saw the crowd harassed, helpless. And he turned the eyes of the disciples to those people and said, the harvest is plenty. Pray. In John 4, 34, 35, 35 said, Lift up your eyes and behold the fields. Vision. What are you seeing? See, I have given Jericho into your hand. But it also takes effective teams. God's Battles are not won by individual heroes, but by weak people working together in teams. Hallelujah. Alexander the Great says, I am not afraid of many lions led by a sheep. I'm afraid of many sheep led by a lion. When there is a team and proper leadership, the weakest group can become strong. Praise the Lord. Moses in Exodus 17 built a team. Joshua, you know the story of mission partnership, very popular. Joshua went to the mission field. Moses carried a rod of authority, prayer to the mountain. Aaron and her were providing the physical support. And the work on the mountain will determine the result on the field. Many times, the poor results on our feet are because of weak support teams at home. 
So in Capro, we take time to build strong praying teams. We call them Capro support team, Capro sending teams. They are the group that make our work happen. They are the ones that fire the bullets. We are the bullets. You are just a bullet. Somebody has got to fire you. And when the devil is looking for who to catch, he doesn't go for the bullet. He goes for those firing. If a gunman walked into this hall, God forbid, as we say in Africa, if a gunman walked into this hall and started firing, you can do one or two things. If you want to stop the killing, you don't go picking the bullet. What do you do? You pin down the gunman. Do you notice that in Exodus 13, when the devil wanted to stop Joshua, he went to Moses and weakened the hands. Before you look for money, can you find people to pray for you? We're talking about purpose and passion. Only in the place of prayer is passion renewed. Only in the place of prayer is God's purpose affirmed. Say, the young lion shall lack food, even the youth shall grow weary. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew strength. Prevailing prayer. Hallelujah. God told them to get the priest to march forward with praise and prayer. Every apostolic move is usually a product of a prophetic move, which comes from prayer. How do I mean? I see Lois hungry. It burdens me. I said, Lord, please give him food. Give him food. That's prayer. Now, a prayer that ends with prayer is bad. Prayer must end with an assignment from God. The critical thing about prayer is not what you are telling God, it's what God is telling you in return. When does prayer start? When God has not spoken. When does prayer end? After he has spoken. So God will say, you know what, go to the kitchen and get Lois a cup of coffee. The word he spoke, go to the kitchen, is the prophetic move. My marching to the kitchen is my apostolic move. So every apostolic move, what you do for God, must come from what God has told you, which is a prophetic move, and it only comes from prayer. I think it was in one of the work books. I read many books from work. But it says, the history of missions is the history of answered prayers. Every inch of advance is by prevailing prayer. If there's one thing God must revive in work and in the mission community is the power of prayer. We strategize, we consult, we plan, we pray little. So, Judah always led the battle, Judges 1. In Nehemiah project, there were people building, there were people keeping watch. There were people bringing the resources. Bible says, weapons of warfare are not carnal. They are mighty true God for pulling down strongholds. Those closed doors, those gates, those Jerichos can only be opened by prevailing prayer. 